Before we end the chapter, I should address uh, Bohr's correspondence principle. Bohr addressed the the um, const consternation. I don't know if that's the right word. The um, concern or the doubt, of course, in, in 1913, 1914, nobody believed in quantum mechanics. Einstein, Planck, Planck, Planck didn't like uh, quantum mechanics. Einstein um, certainly later in life or, or at various times doubted some of what quantum mechanics told him. Um, and it wasn't until the 20s when there was enough evidence supporting quantum mechanics um, that scientists really had to accept it. Um, and one of the ways that Bohr tried to help this understanding of quantum mechanics is, is asking the question, how do we accept the quantum view of the world when the classical world is so well understood? Right? Well, again, 1900, remember, we've got to put this in context. 1900, we thought we knew everything. Now we turn it on its head with this quantum mechanics, which is so bizarre, um, more bizarre than relativity was. Um, and uh, <clears throat> this idea that things only come in discrete quantities um, while it, you know, sort of goes with the atomist view um, of prior to, to Aristotle, uh, it is really uncomfortable. So, so, so Bohr answered the question, when do you treat something quantum mechanically or when do you treat it classically? And what Bohr said was, in the limits of where quantum mechanics and classical, classical physics should agree, quantum mechanics should reduce to the classical result. In other words, they're not so different from each other. They're not just com two completely different things. That there's got to be a place where they agree. Um, and that's sort of, it's just, again, think of relativity. Relativity, we know classically that everything we do at car and airplane speeds is absolutely correct, right? It's correct to within 16 decimal places. Might as well be correct. Um, whereas when you get up to higher and higher speeds, you, you start to get relativistic or, or let's, take, let's go to relativistic speeds and we say, oh, it's so different. But somewhere, when you get low enough in, in speed, the relativistic result equals the classical result. And this is what Bohr says about quantum mechanics, is that the quantum mechanics result should reduce to the classical result. And indeed, we see that. We see that in, for example, the energy level diagrams at super low energies, which are not classical. I mean, we don't, we don't experience a single atom at its lowest possible energy state in, the, in our daily lives. We generally experience things at much higher energies. And at higher energies, right, the energy states, right, this is an energy level diagram, n equals 1, n equals, you know, going up to n equals infinity. At higher energies, those energies get so, the energies in the energy level diagram, so this is energy going up, um, uh, get so close together that they might as well be continuous. And so you, they, they look classical up here when they get really close together. We saw, we did the example for a classical oscillator, for a classical oscillator where a, a standard energy might be, you know, 10 joules or something, that the smallest possible change in energy for that classical oscillator is on the order of EVs, which is 10 to the minus 19th joules, right? One EV is 10 to the minus, is 1.6 is on the order of, order of magnitude, 10 to the minus 19th joules. That is an immeasurable change in energy compared to the energy of the oscillator. In general, systems with large quantum numbers, right? Remember, we figured out the quantum number of this oscillator. We did when we calculated it. We figured out that it was, you know, some incredibly large number of quanta, large quantum number. If we go up to the to the higher energy states, it's large quantum numbers. Systems with large quantum numbers look classical, and that's we, that's just the that's the world we live in. The cl we live in that classical part of the re of the world. We live in the classical realm. We we live with large quantum numbers around us. Um, if we were as small as as an atom, um, we might live in a different world, but we don't. Um, so we just don't see it usually. And it's very unusual to see quantum effects um, in, in a macroscopic system. There are macroscopic systems where we, see class, where we see quantum effects, but they are few and far between. If you've ever heard of a Bose-Einstein condensate, for example, it's something that I actually studied in graduate school, where you actually see quantum effects in a macroscopic class, what, what might normally be a classical system. But that's unusual, few and far between. 
So Bohr's quanta correspondence principle allows us to um, bring the quantum mechanics to the classical world and allows us to accept that quantum mechanics can exist even though we don't see it.